Thank you. And thank the session, your pastor, for this privilege to share with you from God's Word. The theme verse is 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, to whom be glory both now and forever. Amen. May God bless us in the reading of his most holy and sacred word. And so I have selected the theme, spiritual growth, based upon this theme verse, spiritual growth is the title. There will be a total of eight messages, and it will be taken from 2 Peter chapter 3. With one exception, the second message will be taken from 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 to verse 3. And focusing on the theme of spiritual growth, the first message is entitled, Grow or Die. The second message, enemies of God. Third message, don't forget to grow. Fourth message, hindrance to growth. Fifth message, time for growth. Sixth message, focus of growth. Seventh message, home of growth. And final message, food for growth. The first message, Grow or Die, taken from verses 17 and 18 of 2 Peter chapter 3. We are surrounded by many things that grow. First and foremost, our babies. We see them grow up in our homes and their minds, their characteristics, their behavior, all will grow and change constantly. We look at the trees. Trees never stop growing unless they are diseased and then they will die. Then we look at the animal kingdom, the birds, the fish. Every creature in God's creation grows in one way or another. And then we have cities. We have population. They continue to grow. It is everywhere. And then when we also see growth, we also see the end of growth. That's death, decay, destruction. Everything that grows will also decay and also die. We are surrounded by this truth as well. And so that seems to be this antithesis of growth and death. And that's our focus in our first message, grow or die. And we are applying this to the spiritual realm. Now, we are not talking about someone who can lose his salvation when we speak of death. The moment a person who is a sinner sincerely, truly accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior and is truly born again in Christ Jesus according to Scriptures. He can never lose his salvation. So we're not talking about him losing his salvation whereby he will die in sin and end up in hell. We're not referring to that kind of death. Because this injunction from God, actually, it's a command. Grow in grace and in the knowledge refers to present-day experience. And so it is not about growing in grace and in the knowledge when we arrived home in glory in the new heaven and new earth, even though that will be true still. We will continue to grow in grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, especially knowledge. Just imagine when you walk in the streets of gold in the new heaven and new earth of Revelation 21. We will continue to learn more and more things about the new heaven and new earth, and of course about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so therefore, we will continue to grow in that sense, in heaven. But this verse, in verse 18, is not a reference to that growth. This is right here and now on this earth. And therefore, this growing and dying must be understood in terms of the present. 
And since we have already explained that if a person is truly born again, he can never die spiritually again, that means he dies in sin and end up in hell. Then what death are we referring to? It is the death of his holy witness for Christ. Now you might think that, well, that is no big deal, isn't it? As long as I am born again, as long as I am saved, it's okay. Well, I can be a bad witness, it doesn't matter. It matters a lot. It matters to God, it matters to Christ, and it must matter to you. Because it matters to everybody else around you. Those who are not born again, if you lose your holy witness for Christ, what is the Christ you're going to present to them? If you present to them a carnal Christ, a Christ who tells lies because you tell lies, a Christ who loves the world, the things of the world, because you love the things of the world and the world. And if that person who is not a Christian believes in that kind of Christ, oh, if I become a Christian, I believe in the Christ that you offer me, you present to me, then I'll be like you. Carnal, love the world, this is what I want. He has no salvation, but he thinks he has because you presented to him a Christ that he has embraced. Worse still is if the person rejects the Christ that you have presented, which is not the Christ of the Bible, which is a good Christ, a holy Christ. And then he rejects the Christ, thinking that he has rejected the Christ of the Bible because he doesn't read the Bible. And even if he does, he doesn't understand the Bible since he's not born again. And so the Christ that he is going to understand and reject in, the, in this case is only the Christ that you present. And if you present a false Christ, a carnal Christ, he thinks he has rejected the Christ of the Bible, but actually he has rejected a false Christ. And so sometime down the road, if he were to be given the gospel again, and this time, someone who will share with him the gospel according to the Bible, he will reject the Christ as well, because please don't continue. I have already heard that kind of gospel, and I have already rejected it. No, thank you. He walks away. So he thinks that he has rejected, he has been presented with the Christ of the Bible, which is false because of your bad testimony, your carnality, where you didn't bother to protect and to watch over your testimony for Christ because they are going to see your life. They can't see your thinking. They can't see the inward salvation that has already occurred in your heart. All they can see is the outward person, you. Your dressing, how you look. Everything about you has to be visible for them to see Christ. And therefore, your physical witness can die. That means it dies when you are no longer a holy witness. It dies when you become a carnal, sinful witness. And that is the meaning of the word die in this title, grow or die. Verses 17 and 18 will be our focus. The first thing we see and we realize is the obstacle to growth. The obstacles are real. Otherwise, the Bible would not give us the warning in the first part of verse 17. Ye therefore, the word ye there is emphasized, that means you all believers, truly born again believers. Peter, the apostle, wrote this last and final epistle, most likely in Rome. And according to extra biblical sources, he died in 66 AD. And so this epistle would be around that time. The persecution of Christians was increasing because in AD 64, crazy Caesar Nero burned Rome and blamed it on the Christians. And so it doesn't matter whether you are a Jewish believer or a Gentile believer from henceforth. Every Roman citizen will now come after you. You are now open season, like a criminal as far as they are concerned. And so not only were the people who believed in Christ during Peter's time 
experiencing all kinds of physical outward persecution. They also face a lot of attack, especially from doctrines, false teachings. And that's what the Bible here refers to, ye therefore, beloved, seeing ye know these things before. What things? The things that he had already written, which we are going to look at, but because of only eight messages, we can afford to only look at one chapter. That's chapter 3 and one small little section of the first three verses of Second Peter chapter 2. But it would be good if you were to read First and Second Peter together in your own time to help and to grant you the understanding of what Peter meant. You already knew. So it is not something that was secretive, hidden. Those who are truly born again with the Spirit of God dwelling in you, you should know that there will be obstacles to your growth, your spiritual growth. First and foremost, what gives us this knowledge? Because he says that you already know. Look around you. First and foremost, look around the environment, the world we are living in. What world were they living in? The world of the Romans. What were the Roman world like? It's a life very similar to our world. Our first world in particular. All those big cities all over the world, including Perth, Singapore, Melbourne, Sydney, New York, Tokyo, all these big, beautiful, tall building, high-rise cities. Very similar to Rome. First world country. Superpower status. Greatest and the most advanced nation in that region at that time. First world status. Just like what we claim, first world status. They had it all. So what kind of world is a first world status like? A world of temptation? A world of seduction? A world of wicked people? Evil? All kinds of sin that you could imagine, you'll find it there. They indulge in homosexuality. They indulge in fornication. They indulge in adultery. And these are not considered sinful. Homosexuality is common in their pagan worship. The Bible in the King James called it sodomy. Fornication and adultery in normal way of life, it's not criminal, it's common. Why do you think in the book of Acts, in Acts 15, when the Jews from Judea argue and said that Gentiles must be circumcised or else they cannot be saved. And they argue and debated. All the most spiritually mature leaders, the apostles and the elders came together. And the conclusion was that the Gentiles do not need to be circumcised to be saved. But what they needed to be was to stay away, abstain, from the pollution of fornication, of idolatry, idols. They have to stay away from fornication. Why? Because it was the normal, accepted way of life. According to the law of God, when Israel was a sovereign nation, an adulterer was stoned to death. Why do you think they tried to trick the Lord Jesus Christ in John chapter 8? by presenting in front of him and the big crowd. This woman was caught in adultery. What do you say, Jesus of Nazareth? If Jesus said, it's okay because the law of Rome doesn't criminalize fornication or adultery, just like today in Singapore, in many first world countries, it is even promoted and make into something very beautiful and acceptable in our movies. When two grown men and women, consensual fornication is no longer a shameful, stigmatic behavior. It is normal now. And they even have children. It used to be 
a stigma to be born in a home where mom and dad are not married, but no longer. And so if Jesus were to say, it's okay, that means Jesus is now telling the people, teaching the people to break the laws of God because the law of God say, stone her. And if Jesus were to say, stone her, then they will trap the Lord Jesus Christ and report him to the Romans, charging him for committing murder because stoning a person is murder because according to the Roman law, and since Israel was under the Roman Empire, you have to abide by the Roman law. And so it was a problem that they thought that no one could get out of. Jesus was trapped. But thank God the Lord Jesus Christ, with the wisdom from on high, he who had no sin cast the first stone. And so he obeyed both laws by one simple statement. Just to give us an idea of the debaucherous kind of life that this verse was given to us to reveal to us of the obstacles to our growth. The world that we're living in is not friendly toward holy living. Everything about the world is to undermine your holy life from your school system to your working life to your entertainment. No exception. Why? Because this is the world of the devil. He controls all the mass media. He controls the education system all over the world. He controls what they study. He controls everything. That's why he's known as the God of this world who has blinded the minds of those who have rejected the gospel. And the only ones on earth that his minds have not blinded are those who have accepted the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you say that you are a believer, you have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior, then what Peter warned, seeing ye know these things, you would amen to it. Because this word know is to know beforehand. You have already tasted it. You have already experienced it. It's not just some head knowledge. It includes head knowledge, what you observe, what you know, what you see, and what you have experienced in your own life. Before salvation, have you not tasted and experienced how evil and wicked this world that we are living in? And if you want to be holy in this world of unholiness, you think your holiness is going to just simply be permitted to exist? You think the devil is not trying to stop you and switch off your light of holiness? He will try his best. Because look at the world, the environment they are living in. It's not friendly toward a holy witness. If Jesus Christ were to return, were to come again, the first coming, let's say, not the second coming, second coming, they couldn't touch him. He will come as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. But let's say he comes to be our saviour. You think the world is going to believe him, embrace him, or the world is going to crucify him again? I'm sure you know the answer. It's the second. They're going to crucify him again, and again, and again. How do we know that? Look at the whole history of the church. It's littered with thousands of believers who wanted to live like Christ, present the holy Christ to the whole world. And what did they do? They were martyred for their faith. They were killed for their faith. The obstacles are all around us. The question is, are you able to see them? Peter says, Ye therefore, beloved, seeing, you know you can see them. The question is, do you want to see them? You have the ability to see them. When you send your children to school, please understand that this is not the school from heaven. This is the school of the earth where the devil is in control. The whole system. We're not asking you to homeschool. Please, homeschool is not the solution. It may be the solution in some instances, in some cases, but it has its pros and cons. Go to the school. It's fine. Just like Daniel did not take issue when he was in Babylon as a teenager. They tried to reprogram him in three ways. 
First, they changed his name. It's like when you go to school, people call you nicknames. All kinds of funny names because when you want to give thanks for your food, when you want to be holy, when you do not behave like all the rest of your classmates, you're going to be different. Rest assured, they're going to call you names and they can call Daniel after the names of their Babylonian gods. He just simply, fine, you can call me what you want, but I know in my heart of hearts that I am Daniel. My judge is God. That's the meaning of his name. He didn't bother about that. You call me by the name of your gods, Belshazzar, fine. Or Belteshazzar, that's fine. But I know who I am. You can't change my identity by just changing my name. Then they gave him a Babylonian education. Learn the language, learn their science, learn their arts, and I'm sure it will be littered with all kinds of truth and error. When it comes to mathematics, fine, that's mathematical truth. You can accept. 2 plus 2 equals 4, fine, accept that. There's nothing wrong with accepting 2 plus 2 equals 4, 2 times 3 equals 6. But when it comes to all other subjects that contradicted Scripture, they can force you to believe it. They can force you to accept it as your conviction. Just like evolution. They can teach me evolution, but I know the world is not billions of years old. It's only a few thousand years old based upon biblical calculation. I know what I believe, what my conviction is. You can teach me whatever you want. As long as I know the truth, I can reject your truth. And Daniel did not take issue with that, and therefore it's okay if you go to the secular education, but always have the ability to discern, like Daniel, what is wrong, reject. What is right, you accept. The third was the diet, the food, and that will tarnish his witness, and that's the only thing that he took issue with. And that is what you need to do. Seeing you know, we live in a world where it is a mixture of some things that are acceptable, some things that are not acceptable, because we live in a world where it is based upon God's common grace, that we live in a society where there is some law and order. Not everything in the world is bad. Please understand that. We live in a society, we live in a world not everything is bad, and that's why it is so dangerous. If everything is bitter, you spit everything out. And so the devil will mix it with bitter and sweet. And so if you forget that it is bitter and you think that it is sweet, then that's where the problem comes. Please understand, not everything from the world is bad. If it is bad, then we should not drive, drive a car. Is there anything wrong with driving a car? It will improve our mobility, help us to save time so that we can spend more time in the study of God's Word. So is driving a car bad? No. Is taking a lift sinful? No. It's okay to take a lift. It helps you. You don't want to walk up 10 stories every day you go home. Is it bad to use a lawnmower to help you trim the grass? It speeds up a lot of time rather than get a scissors or some other manual instrument. It helps to help you gain more time so that you can study God's Word better. So it's not everything that is bad in that sense. You go to school, there will be some good stuff. There will be some benefit. You know friends, you are able to witness for Christ. But there will also be a mixture of bad things. In the working world, it's the same thing. You go to the office, you may be helping people to build buildings, to be a teacher, to teach children, to also work in hospitals, to help people get better from sicknesses. Nothing wrong with all those things, but in the midst of it, you have all kinds of philosophies, all kinds of ideas, all kinds of behavior, morality and ethics. They are not biblical. And that's where you have to be on guard, and that's where you have to be very discerning, and you have to beware of. And these evil just don't float in the air, and you pluck them down from the thin air, and just fall down from the sky. They come from evil people. So bear that in mind. 
When you think of the obstacles of growth, look at where you are, the world. It's a dangerous world. It's a carnal world. And then look at the people. The world is divided only into two types of people, people of God and the people of the God of this world. That's it. There is no third. Only two groups. Which group do you belong to? Either group will have its own dangers. Those who belong to the God of this world, they are now in bondage to sin. And if they die in the sin, with sin as their master, telling them what to do with their whole life, at the end of it, the wages that the sin is going to pay them as their master is death. And so the Bible says the wages of sin is death. That is our danger. You continue to walk on this earth, you could die at any time. You know death is no respecter of age. You might think that I'm only 10 years old, I'm only 12 years old, I'm just a young child. Death will not touch me. You go to the cemetery and you just walk slowly and look at the ages of the people who die there. The youngest person I buried was only a few weeks old. It used to be a baby of six months old. But now it was only a few weeks or a few days old. The baby died, one of our own church members. Very sad and tragic. But the comfort is that baby is in the arms of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so please don't think that because you are young and now the doctor has given you a clean bill of health, you are fine. Salvation is not something that you can just procrastinate and sit on it. As long as you belong to the group where your father is, the God of this world, the devil, you are always in grave danger because the moment you die in that state and condition, the Bible says you die in sin, you end up in hell. The other group, they belong to the Lord Jesus Christ because they have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and as Savior. Who died for them, suffered for them, lived for them, rose from the dead for their justification. Do you think that when you once upon a time was a sinner, now you become a child of God, a saint? God has plucked you out of that terrible state and condition. You think the devil will now leave you alone when you change your army from being his soldier to the army of God? He will come after you, and he will not stop coming after you. And when you look at your life, and you look at the lives of others, you look at the lives of the saints of old, the time where you will come under greatest attack by the devil will be during the tail end of your life. Do you know that? Common sense will tell you, the higher you go, the bigger the fall. The more impact your life has been with people, and if the Lord has blessed you and used you mightily and given you many spiritual gifts, there will be a lot of people looking up to you. And then you stumble and you fall. You know how big the sound would be, how many people you're going to drag down with you when you fall. Look at the life of this man called Ravi Zacharias. I'm sure you heard of him. A very, very clever and well-spoken apologist when he was alive. Defending Christ, defending Christianity. Very eloquent, very confident man when he speaks. You find him speaking to thousands of people. A lot of people saw him as their champion of champions when it comes to defending the Christian faith, defending Christ, defending Christianity and the Word of God. And then when he died, suddenly, more and more of his terrible, terrible skeletons were uncovered. Even when he was alive, there were allegations. And then he defended himself, and so all his friends who were close to him, they believed him and not those who hurled those allegations. But now they realized their mistake, and now they admitted it. And when he fell, the bang echoed around the whole world. 
if Ravi Zacharias had fallen one week after he came out into the ministry, nobody knew him. And if he fell at that point in his life, one week after he started his ministry, nobody knew him. And if he were to fall, he made no sound. But after how many years, very, very many years, I do not know how many years he was in ministry. But his name is worldwide. His name kept appearing over the internet when the skeletons were being uncovered one by one, one by one. His testimony for Christ literally died by all these attacks. The obstacles to your growth, to my spiritual growth, to your spiritual growth, they are real. And they never stop until you breathe your last breath. And they will continue to come continually. And the Bible warns us, beware. Beware. That's the word. A warning. How long should I beware nonstop? You protect and you guide yourself all your life. Closer you are to the finishing line, the more beware, the more on guard you ought to be. And the word beware literally means to be on guard. It's like there is a sentry placed outside your home. You know, in Singapore, the homes of ministers and prime ministers, there is a booth, there is a sentry outside their main gate. Not anyone can just simply walk into their home. There is a sentry, and the sentry there will be awake all the time. Of course, they will be on rotation. They were protected because the ministers are at home, the minister's family and loved ones, they're all at home. And so they have to be protected. You beware and you put sentries to protect your holy witness. You don't have to put sentries to protect your salvation. That is secured by God. God the Father and God the Son says, your salvation is in my hand and no one can snatch it and take it away from you. But you have to make sure that you are born again. If you're not truly born again and all you have is, I think I'm born again, you are in a terrible, dangerous state. Because you don't want to find out after you die that you're going to end up in hell because then it's no escape. You're going to make sure your salvation right here and now with fear and trembling. Those were the two words that the Apostle Paul used when he charged the Christians in the church in Philippi. Make sure you work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And you and I need to do so. Please don't think that you are saved by serving in the church, by coming to church, even by preaching from the pulpit, even by sharing the gospel with people. No one can be saved by doing Christian works because that was exactly what the Pharisees promoted with Jesus Christ rejected and exposed as false. Make sure of your salvation and then put sentries to protect your holy witness, because it is precious. And don't let that sentry go to sleep. Beware. Be your own sentry. God, it's your life. It's your holy witness that you have been spending years to build. Don't let the devil tear it down and snatch it away from you when you are so close to the finishing line. This is a reference and appeal to those who are in their aged years. Oh, you're retired, you're retired in so many things, and so therefore I should retire in my holy witness. That's foolish talking. You never retire in your foolish witness. You can retire from jobs, you can retire from playing whatever games or sports you used to play when you were much healthier, but you never, never let down your guard when it comes to your holy witness. The devil will throw everything at you when you are in your 60s and 70s and 80s and even in your 90s because that's where when you fall and stumble, it will impact the greatest number of people and that's what the devil wants. Obstacles to growth are all around us. 
beware. Beware. Because when you stumble and fall, what will be the outcome? You will not grow. Lest ye also being led away, and the word led away is the word seduce, with error of the wicked. That is the deceit of the wicked. And then you're going to fall from your own steadfastness. Not lose your salvation. Your steadfastness, that means your stance for the Lord Jesus Christ all these years will just come tumbling down. You lose it. And once you lose it, you don't have time to gain it back. You can only do damage control and minimize the damage, that's all. It's not like you are in your 20s where you can relive and build your testimony all over again. You've been building it for the past 20, 30 years and now you are in your 50s or 60s depending on when you accept the Christ. And that has happened sadly and tragically to many people. There was a man, he and his wife, they were counseled by the board of elders not to attend the wedding of their own daughter, first wedding in the family. Because she was a Christian, called herself a Christian, in the church as a Christian, attended church as a Christian, served in the church as a Christian. But now she wanted to marry someone who doesn't want to be baptized. Well, he says he's a believer. It was wrong in the first place for her to court an unbeliever. Now, whether the parents did something to stop her, warn her, we do not know. But what we knew was that they were about to get married. And so when we found out, they said that he's a believer, and so we tried to help. And we asked him to be baptized first. And we explained to him why, how important baptism was as a witness for Christ. But then he says, no, I don't want to because I don't want to upset my mom. He's not a kid. He's old enough to get married. And so it is a matter of upsetting the mother or upsetting Christ. He chose, I don't want to upset my mom. Oh, I will get baptized after the wedding. With the Bible's instruction and in our constitution, he must be baptized in order to be married in the church and be the head of the family and to claim God's blessing as they begin their lives together as husband and wife. How can someone ask for the blessings of God when he refuses to publicly confess that Jesus Christ is my Lord as my Savior at water baptism? And so the father was warned and counseled before the wedding. And then when the wedding came, he participated, we heard about it, and so we met up with him after the incident to confirm whether it actually happened. And so when we asked him, you were told again and again, you were warned before the wedding how dangerous and how you must, for Christ's sake, even for your daughter's sake, let her know that you love the Lord Jesus Christ more than her. You cannot participate in the wedding. And his reply, I will never forget. She is my daughter. That's it. She is my daughter. What about Christ? Silence on his part. What about Christ? She is my daughter. Fall from our own steadfastness. By what? Led away with the error of the wickedness. Led away by the error. Don't pick and choose how you want the Bible to be understood and interpreted in order to fit and suit your own ideas and thinking. Because if you do that, the one you're going to hurt will be yourself. And you're going to fall into the ruination of what Peter warned 
the Christians to beware of. Fall from your own steadfastness. The family left the church, of course, not happy, upset with the leadership. He had to restart his witness all over again in another church. You join another church in your 60s and 70s. What can you do? What can you serve? You've been in this church for decades. You join, let's say, in your 30s. And you build already a witness, a testimony, that people know you. You know them. And now because of this one transgression, you fall from your own steadfastness. And now you join another church. What do you do with the rest of your life? They're not going to ask you to just simply come and serve and do this and do that. They don't know you. You don't know them. They need time to know you, but you don't have time anymore. You're running out of time. You don't have the strength and youthful zeal and energy anymore. So far, so good for so many years, and then one moment, she's my daughter. That was it. I'm sure it is not something that just happened. They were supposed to be believers when the children were born into their homes. They had a long time bringing the child up in the fear and nurture of the Lord. And when we fail as parents and do not do what we are supposed to do, this will be the outcome. And then in their evening, in your evening years, when they grow up and they are faced with such a situation and you are faced with such a situation, why do you want to put yourself in such a situation where you have to choose between your daughter or Christ? Why do you not avoid this kind of terrible, terrible dilemma when they were very young and you should bring them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord right from the very beginning? When the children were born, let it be Christ first and always so that when they are grown up, it is so much easier to choose Christ and not your daughter, not your son. Because that has always been your way of life. Christ must always be first. And when it has not been the case, and then now you're confronted, Christ, oh, my daughter, what do you think? You have not been faithful in the least. How do you expect yourself to be faithful in the much? Parents with young children, take heed. You have to grow. Because if you do not grow, the moment you are not growing, you're going to fall. You're going to be deceived. You're going to be led away. You and I are witnessing for Christ in a world uh, surrounded by obstacles. And every obstacle is trying to stumble you to slow down your growth if they can to stop your growth. And the moment your growth is stopped, you're going to begin to decay and die. There is no neutrality. Well, if I'm not growing, I'm also not dying. No, you, either you keep on growing or you're going to slide down, you're going to die. Your witness is going to die. It's going to decay. You're going to keep on uh, growing. The moment you stop growing, you begin to die. And so what exactly is the state and condition right now of your, in your holy witness, your spiritual growth? Is it growing or is it decaying? You are on that brink. Decaying, you keep on going down. Growing, you keep on going up. Just like a child. Every day your child wakes up, he's one day older. The moment when your child stops growing, that means your child is dead. You know that, right? The moment your spiritual growth is not growing, you're dead, you're dying. We forget things. You know, there are some 
seminary students, Bible college students, spending three, four, five, some even six, seven years studying the Bible. And they spend hundreds of hours studying the Bible, memorization of the Word of God, Bible verses, and have written papers and taken many exams, and then they passed. And so with so many hundreds of hours of intensive study, they think that, well, I don't need to study the Bible anymore after I'm in the ministry. And so many of them will keep their old sermons and put them in files now with computer. You don't even need to have them in hard copy. It's all in the computer. And if you ask them, can you speak from this particular book, this text? Oh, they just go to the computer and check on the computer where the book and the text and the verses and the sermon outline will be there. The sermon will be there. They just take it out, read it, refresh it, and then boom, they go. And some of them do that. They become very, very slothful, lazy. They stop growing. What do you think happened? They have just simply turned themselves into hirelings. You think the Word of God is to be handled and understood in this manner? Well, you just simply store them in a file and then that's it. The Word of God must be studied day in and day out as if it is the first time you are tasting it. It's fresh. Don't get some old cooked food and feed your guests and feed God's people. You prepared that sermon 10 years ago. 10 years ago, your spiritual level will be 10 years level. 10 years ago. 10 years later, should you not grow more spiritual? Should your spirituality not increase? And we know that the more mature you are in faith, and when you study the Word of God with that kind of maturity, the Lord will open your eyes, enabling you to see more. But when you keep on all using your own notes, you are like a person using his PSLE notes to study for his university exam. You do that. You use your PSLE notes to study for university exam. Nobody will do that. But why do we do it in the spiritual realm? Why do you not want to study the Word of God afresh? Now that you are much more mature, should you not study afresh and plead with God to open your eyes to study and study and study better so that you can feed God's people better rather than some old, old sermon outline that you did 10 years ago? The moment you stop growing, you begin to die. And Peter knew that, and so he warned them, beware, beware. You do not allow yourself to be led away by errors. Errors would be doctrines, wrong doctrines, bad doctrines will lead you astray. Because the moment you believe in the error, your life will be lived in light of that error. You believe in the truth, your life will be lived in light of that truth. And that's how you are led astray, because sometimes this leading astray, you might not even be aware of it. That's how deadly and dangerous and deceptive the devil is, and all his minions who assist him. You ask any Roman Catholics, they will think they're going to heaven. They will think that they're believing in the Christ of the Bible. You ask any charismatic, they believe in the health and wealth gospel. They really sincerely believe that they're going to heaven. They sincerely, truly believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross for their sins so that they can be healthy and wealthy on earth. They really sincerely believe. That's the danger of deception, being led away, being seduced. They don't even know it. Do you know? And so Peter says, in order for you to stop growing, you must continue to grow. Keep on growing. That's the only way. You never stop. You never stop. The moment you stop, you begin to die. Please understand this. You keep on growing. But grow. That's why he used the word grow, present tense. Keep on growing. Grow. Grow in what? Grow in the grace and in the knowledge. Grace and knowledge cannot be separated. Grace here refers to blessings from God that we don't deserve, right? That's the definition of grace. Mercy is withholding the punishment that we deserve. That's mercy. 
Paul emphasized grace. Right here and now, keep on nonstop growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ as you witness for Christ in this sin-filled environment with all the obstacles in front of you, around you, behind you, trying its best to stop you from growing. But you must keep on growing and don't stop. What exactly does it mean to grow in grace? What are some of the blessings that we already enjoy right now? Right, that's the key. Uh, we know that when we arrive home in heaven, we don't deserve to be in heaven, but God says, that's going to be your new home. Now, that is definitely God's grace, right? Blessings from God that we don't deserve. You know we don't deserve to be in heaven. And so that indeed is a definition of one example of God's grace, but that's in heaven. Now, remember, this verse is right now. So we have to talk about present-day grace that we have already enjoyed right now. And one of them would be prayer. Do you know how great that grace is? That we don't deserve to be able to stand in the presence of God Most High, in His most holy place, the Holy of Holies, and have all that we ask, our petitions, be heard by Him. And when we pray according to His holy will, He not only hears them, He answers them accordingly to what you ask because of Jesus Christ, our great high priest. Of course, this prayer, which is one of the many, many aspects of the grace of God, must begin with salvation. Because of the salvation that we have in Christ, that is the greatest grace that begins our journey of God's grace. That's why the Bible says we are saved by grace through faith. And if you are truly born again, then the other aspects of God's grace, such as prayer, should be your daily diet because this is one of the blessings that God says you pray without ceasing. And there is the ability to forgive. You know how wonderful it is to our own soul when we have the ability to forgive? When people are not able to forgive, Little by little, they're going to become very bitter. They're going to become very, very unhappy and they are a wretch inside their soul. Because as you live more and more disappointments you're going to experience. You're going to experience betrayals. You're going to experience people who you thought were your friends, but actually they will become your worst enemies. And you're going to face a lot of such very bitter experiences. And the people of the world, they can't forgive. And with more and more bitterness, what do you think will, become, will happen to you? You become a very bitter person. But once in Christ Jesus, you're able to forgive. No matter what anyone might do to you on earth, in Christ Jesus, you're able to forgive. And peace, another blessing, another gracious blessing will abound in your heart and in your life. Then the power over sin. You have the strength to overcome sin. The dominion of sin over you is broken forever in Christ. Isn't that a very gracious blessing? Whatever addiction you have in Christ Jesus, you can overcome them. You can't get rid of smoking in Christ, you can. You can't get rid of drinking in Christ, you can. You can't get rid of pornography in Christ, you can. In Christ, you can do anything. Sure, sometimes you may stumble and fall back into sin, but in Christ, you have overcome that dominion. It doesn't mean that you will no longer sin. But you have the strength from God not to allow sin to dominate you anymore. Isn't that a gracious blessing? And to be able to come and sing hymns and praises and worship, isn't that another gracious blessing? To be able to worship the Most High God and He will receive it as a sweet savor sacrifice from His own children redeemed by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then we can enjoy sweet Christian fellowship. The world doesn't understand what fellowship means. We do. We taste it. We enjoy it. When we are with brothers and sisters in Christ, we don't have to put up any guard. We can talk about the things of God. And your language and your vocabulary, they're all seasoned with salt. 
And you know that when this person said this, I know he meant exactly what he said. That is no, yes mean no, no means yes. He is a transparent brother and sister in Christ. I know they care for my spiritual well-being just as much as I care for their spiritual well-being. He will not take advantage of me just as I will not take advantage of him. That's Christian fellowship. The world doesn't understand this. The world will always be suspicious of one another because in the world, self-preservation always tops everything. Today, you are my friend, but if I have to make a choice between my friend, myself and my family, I have to sacrifice you, my friend. But not the child of God. The child of God will do what is right. If I have to sacrifice in order for you to have God's will accomplished in your life, I will do it gladly. Was that not how Jonathan gave up his kingdom for David, his best friend? Because he will protect David's spiritual well-being and God's will in his life. He will help David fulfill God's will in his life just as he knew David would help him fulfill God's will in his life. And it just so happened that the will of God in Jonathan's life was to give your kingdom over to David, and he did. He did not at any time sabotage David, which he could. You know how blessed you are to be able to have that kind of fellowship on this earth, this sin-filled world, to have brothers and sisters in Christ that are truly, truly brothers and sisters who will love you and care for you and sacrifice for you. That's family. Now, this is just a small, short little list of the grace of God. And the grace of God must always be measured in terms of Bible knowledge. And that's why grow in grace and in the knowledge. Grow together. There's grace. There's Christian fellowship. There's prayer. There's all these things that we talk about. The love of God as our new motive. All these are part of the grace of God. We cannot exercise them, we cannot experience them, we cannot know them and apply them into our lives properly and correctly without the truth. Without the truth, we can't love properly, we can't fellowship properly, we can't pray properly, we can't do anything properly without God's truth. That's why I grow in grace and in the knowledge, hand in hand, side by side, together. That's how you keep growing, by keep on studying the Bible, I keep on obeying the Bible as you study it so that your prayer life will become stronger and deeper and more and more intimate and personal with your Lord and your God and your Savior. That's how you keep growing. And your aim, motive for growth, is not just to show off. To Him be glory forever both now and forever. Now and forever. Now means right now, here on earth and unto eternity. You do it for the glory of Christ. You do it not to show off that you are better than everybody else. There is no pride in this. It's just simply the normal, natural or supernatural experience in every believer's life. That's why God says we are all born again like a newborn babe in Christ on the day of our salvation. And then God says, I want you to remain here on earth and be my holy witness so that you will bear a much clearer image of Jesus Christ as the days go by. That's maturity. This is your aim, to glorify God by your spiritual growth and maturity. Because the more you grow, the more you'll be like Christ, the easier it is for the people around you to see Christ. That's why grow or die. Grow or die. Dear friend, keep on growing. Never stop growing. Because you and I are growing in a world filled with obstacles. And these obstacles has only one purpose, and that is to stop us from growing. The moment we stop growing, we begin to die. Now remember, we're not talking about losing salvation. It's about your holy witness. Don't let it die. And therefore, to keep it alive, you've got to keep on growing. Keep on growing. How? In grace and in the knowledge. And the purpose is to glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ right now and into eternity. Let us pray.